Nice. But they're not prescription. That's very funny. I'm wondering, I'm wondering why I can't see them. I would do it. Perfectly all Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak, Director of International Security Studies at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting, another in our ongoing series on nonproliferation uh, that is co-sponsored with the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Today's uh, session is being webcast and will be uh, archived uh, for uh, those uh, um, at the lab who are unable to be here today. Um, Today's meeting within the Wilson Center is co-sponsored uh, with uh, our Middle East program, which is directed by Hala S. Fandiari, and our, uh, Middle e our Asia program headed by Bob Hathaway and Mark Moore, who's here today from, from the Asia program, and we appreciate the, the collaboration on today's meeting. And the, the collaboration reflects the wide-ranging uh, dimensions of, of the uh, book that our speaker, Etel Salingen, will speak about today. Uh, the, the book is Nuclear Logics, contrasting subtitled Contrasting Paths in East Asia and the Middle East. Uh, for those here today, copies uh, are available for purchase outside the door, and for those watching on webcast, uh, Amazon.com. It's, it's an excellent addition to the literature on nonproliferation, and we're delighted that she can be here today to talk about that book. One of the goals of this series, uh, which is to be a forum between the worlds of, of uh, academia and public policy, which is indeed the core mission of the Wilson Center, is to feature new scholarship that is policy relevant coming from academia. And today's book. Uh, that Ethel uh, will we'll discuss is an excellent example of policy relevant academic research. Uh, Professor <coughs> Solingen chairs the steering committee of the University of California's Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. She's professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine, vice president, former vice president of the International Studies Association, uh, one of the, the, book, the reviews essay editor of International Organization, um, widely published. Um, uh, on, on a variety of topics in the international security field. Um, several uh, previous books, but a current one is the one she will speak about today, which is uh, the, the, the <coughs> title is a nu Nuclear Logic. So uh, with that, welcome to the Wilson Center, Etel, and the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much. Excuse me, one second. I forgot to mention uh, one thing which I should, uh, which is that my co-chair uh, for this series Joe Pilot from Los Alamos National Laboratory is unable to, uh, to, to be here today, but uh, sends uh, regards and, and the best wishes of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which supports this series. Thank you very much, Rob, uh, for that uh, very generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here. <coughs> there are some flyers on the book if anybody's interested. Uh, what, what I've done in this book is examine nuclear decisions by nine states in East Asia and the Middle East over 40 years in light of major or five major theories of international relations. There are many reasons for comparing these two regions, which we can discuss later. That's perhaps a talk in, in, in itself. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, the book addresses the fundamental question of why some states have pursued nuclear weapons while others have renounced them since the NPT was negotiated in the 1960s. And there, as all of you, I'm sure, know, there have been radical variations in nuclear choices even within the last decade or so. Uh, Argentina, Brazil, and South Africa joined the NPT um, in the 1990s after decades of rejection. Iran, Iraq, Libya, and North Korea either violated or meandered around their commitments to the NPT. India, Pakistan, and North Korea I, uh, <coughs> crossed the nuclear, the nuclear threshold with tests. Israel is not an NPT member and maintains a policy of non acknowledging uh, possession, possession of nuclear weapons. Libya reversed its nuclear ambitions of, of three decades and so on. There's a enormous variability there. And uh, an issue is what explains this variability in, in nuclear behavior. So as I said, the book examines an array of theories, uh, and I won't bore you with them but, uh, 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 so that you get a flavor of it. Uh, does democracy matter? Do nonproliferation norms matter? Does the NPT matter? 
All, all, all these are questions that I subject the different uh, chapters to. But what I will do here is very briefly discuss a conventional answer to this question, which is often a theory that goes by the name of structural realism or neorealism. This is very different from our day-to-day -day concept of realism. Uh, uh, in many instances, what goes by neorealism is not a realistic policy. So a crude extreme formulation of this theory, for instance, is that of Professor Mearsheimer, a, a theory known as offensive realism. But briefly, this theory states that uh, states are bound to seek nuclear weapons because these weapons enhance state power, ensure survival, and generate caution. And although this may indeed be the case uh, sometimes, it actually does not work like that much of the time. This theory over-predicts over -predicts nuclear proliferation. If it was right, if the theory was right, many more states would have nuclear weapons if that logic actually held. Notice, um, notice the empirical anomalies uh, about this theory. Several acutely vulnerable states have not gone nuclear. Even states whose rivals acquired nuclear weapons did not always respond in kind, as with Vietnam, Egypt, many European states, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Jordan, and many others. Uh, Jordan has a security dilemma. I, mean, it, I heard um, <coughs> oftentimes Jordan being referred as ground zero, surrounded by, of course, many, many neighbors uh, of concern. So there, all these countries suggest there are too many dogs that, that didn't bark, or states that faced vulnerabilities but did not actively consider nuclear weapons. As Professor Richard Betts at Columbia University correctly, in my view, argues, insecurity is not a sufficient condition for acquiring nuclear weapons. Many insecure states have not, and indeed insecurity may not even be necessary. States without existential threats have considered or pursued nuclear weapons. Libya is a good example, but also Argentina, Brazil, Algeria, and I would even argue Iraq prior to the war with Iran, prior to the revolution. Uh, but, of course, there are other cases that are stronger than, than that one. So some invoke the role of alliances or superpower coercion in explaining the East Asian cases. However, it, hegemonic protection did not have similar effects. In, uh, hegemonic coer neither hegemonic coercion nor protection had the same effect in other parts of the world. So, for instance, hegemonic protection did not, uh, uh, coercion did not succeed in North Korea, Iran, Israel, Pakistan, and for many years in Iraq. Indeed, for many years in Libya, coercion didn't um, um, play a role. Coercion played virtually no role in nuclear reversals in Argentina, Brazil, and South Africa. Furthermore, states reversed nuclear ambitions even without superpower guarantees. Egypt, Libya in 2003, South Africa, Argentina, and Brazil. Indeed, it's very interesting that Egypt is said to have pursued nuclear weapons under uh, President Nasser when it did enjoy a form of security guarantee from the Soviet Union and relinquished its nuclear weapons uh, as it lost a security guarantee since the U.S. never provided one uh, for it uh, under Sadat. Neorealism has other problems. I, I'm, uh, I'll try to get fast through this. Uh, but these are non -trivial, a non-trivial number of anomalies that suggest that the same geopolitical conditions can lead states to make very different decisions, ranging from overt nuclearization to ambiguous nuclearization to several non-nuclear alternatives. So the theory cannot provide clear markers for who will or who won't acquire nuclear weapons, because it's unable to predict whether nuclear weapons actually enhance or undermine a state security. Virtually every case, um, every case you research, and there's some people here from the National Security Archives and people very familiar with historical research uh, on these issues, you'll see an array of views on this. Uh, and it's unclear why a certain idea prevails over uh, another with respect to the value of nuclear weapons in securing, uh, in, in, in enhancing a state security. States, 
are not monolithic entities, as, as this theory assumes. Uh, this theory fails to consider the internal architecture of states as a serious, serious factor shaping nuclear positions. Alternative explanations fare better, even though nuclear be behavior should be an easy arena for this theory. So uh, it overestimates state security and conflates it with regime security. Uh, let, me, let me then be very specific. Physical survival can be an important consideration for some states, but in many other cases it overestimates state security and thus conflated with regime security. Uh, and even though um, <coughs> security ca can certainly be a, a, an important consideration, without understanding the filter of domestic politics and how this filter interprets spins and transforms external security predicaments, I think we're looking at uh, a very small fraction of the problem. So let me sketch an alternative argument here. <clears throat> yeah, before I move on, I wanted to say that of all these cases that I, that I looked at, it's very, there are nine cases, uh, it's very interesting that in many cases, neorealism fails to explain with ease and at high levels of confidence uh, nuclear behavior, and it does not effortless, effortlessly crowd out other competing theories. Now, why is this important before I move on? It's important because this is the domain, the inner sanctum, the arena where neorealism should have gotten uh, uh, should, have got, should have provided a, an explanation with ease and at high levels of confidence and effortlessly crowding out other theories. But that is not the case. Uh, why do I say that sec national security uh, and, and nuclear uh, behavior is um, at the heart of national security and there is little incentive to spin a theory, for, for instance, for a political leader to spin a theory uh, in other than national security terms, so the documentary ev evidence in some ways load the dice in favor of this theory, and yet you come out skeptical. Now, um, moving then to uh, a conceptual al alternative, Le and also let me, let me caveat this by saying that, uh, again, I'm not claiming physical survival is not an important category, but what I am saying is that uh, a missing variable of the kind that I, that I will introduce in a moment, um, the absence of a variable uh, leads to an overestimation of this particular variable on the outcome of concern, or, or in this case, nuclear behavior we tend to enhance uh, the value of that variable when we don't take into account all the important variables. It's, an, it's a methodological consideration, but an important one, an important one. So the domestic, I argue that the domestic models that leaders survive, uh, adopt to survive in power at home, including their orientation to the global economy, do have implications for nuclear choices. Leaders or ruling coalitions advocating economic growth or integration in the global economy have incentives to avoid the political, economic, <coughs> reputational, and other costs of nuclearization because those costs impair a domestic agenda favoring internationalization. Nuclearization, you can think about Iran right now, can impair domestic macroeconomic and political stability, lots of inflation there, economic reforms, efforts to enhance exports, economic competitiveness, and global access. These are all requirements for implementing internationalizing models of political survival of economic growth through integration into the global economy. These models require expanding private economic activities and foreign, uh, foreign investment and, um, <coughs> and therefore, sorry about that, <coughs> and therefore um, abiding by international institutions is an important component that validates those economic and political choices at home. All this requires a cooperative regional environment that would be destabilized by pursuing uh, nuclear weapons or ambiguous nuclear programs. By contrast, 
Nuclearization implies fewer costs for inward-looking leaders or regimes, suspicious of international markets, investment, technology, capital, uh, and institu international institutions. Such regimes resist integration into the global economy through extensive trade protection, <coughs> state entrepreneurship, and import substitution. This is almost uh, sketching the political economy, certainly of North Korea, but of Iran uh, as well. They protect uncompetitive national industries, sprawling state enterprises, and ancillary related military industrial and nuclear complexes. So nuclear weapons, in short, are ideal technological allies um, t technological and political allies of these leaders because of these things um, listed uh, in here. They enable the construction of a vast, dense, scientific, technological, industrial, and bureaucratic complex that frequently dwarfs other economic endeavors. I know all of you have uh, one instance of this in mind, maybe Iran, but also Argentina, many of these countries um, that engaged uh, or that <coughs> explored um, uh, nuclear programs um, show a similar profile. The complex, uh, this industrial complex is beyond, usually beyond formal budgetary oversight. Again, uh, Iran comes to mind. And the actual or imaginary output of this in uh, military in in nuclear industrial complex is a powerful source of myths. Perón actually in Argentina in the 1950s wrote the manual on this. But then Nasser in a later period, Saddam, Gaddafi, Kim Jong-il, Ahmadinejad um, may have even read the manual. Okay. <coughs> uh, you may, you may, some of you may know that Perón came out in the 1950s announcing that he had, uh, that his scientists had mastered nuclear fusion. Uh, that wasn't the case. Um, now, given these different models, nuclearization has been much less attractive and far more costly for most East Asian leaders since the 1970s, except for North Korea, the anomaly. So you have a trajectory uh, since uh, China exploded nuclear weapon away from nuclear weapons, except for North Korea, the anomaly. And conversely, Many Middle East leaders relied on models of self-sufficiency and nationalism for political survival and had stronger domestic incentives to seek nuclearization. Uh, so moving in the other direction, with one exception, Egypt. Uh, Egypt is an important exception uh, as a leader of the Arab world that remained, um, remained a, you know, a, um, an anomaly in this sort of general trend of nuclearization. Now, heavy regional concentration of internationalizing models in East Asia, on the one hand, reinforced each state's incentive to avoid nuclearization. Conversely, the heavy regional concentration of inward-looking nationalist protectionist models uh, throughout the Middle East exacerbated the mutual incentives uh, to develop nuclear weapons. So this argument finds support from a large number of countries, cases, across different regions. Every case of denuclearization entailed a domestic evolution toward internationalizing coalitions. Of all nuclear aspirants in the last three or four decades, not one endorsed denuclearization fully and effectively under domestic regimes that also rejected integration in, in, into the global economy. Only said it differently, only leaders advancing their political survival through expert-led industrialization undertook effective commitments to denuclearize. And this, of course, includes not just the usual suspects, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, but also Brazil and Argentina in the 1990s, Egypt under Sadat and South Africa, etc. Second, where leaders favoring uh, greater integration in the global political economy were weaker, the more politically constrained they were uh, in curbing nuclear programs. Again, Iran under Khatami may be one instance of this, but it was also the case, for instance, in Argentina and Brazil uh, until uh, these two countries departed from decades of import substitution and sort of inward-looking economic policies. Third. Most defiant nuclear courses have been unmistakably embraced by leaders praising autarkic goals, such as Perón's Argentina, the Kims in North Korea, Kim, Kims and, uh, and Chuche, sort of the, the pivotal concept in their um, politics of uh, political survival. 
uh, radical revolutionaries such as Ahmadinejad in Iran, Libya's Gaddafi, Saddam in Iraq, and even advocates of integration in the global economy may have to contend with regions where uh, there is a strategic interaction in each region. Uh, they have to contend with regions where neighboring leaders endorse alternative economic and nuclear policies. So I spoke about the importance of the incidence of different models in each region. This is obviously much less of a problem in an internationalizing East Asia than in the Middle East where stronger resi resistance to reform poses dilemmas for those who would otherwise prefer internationalization. So to sum up uh, really this um, uh, sketch of the argument, I'd like to say that m domestic models are crucial to, explain, uh, to explaining nuclear choices, not afterthoughts, not residuals. They remain an understudied source of nuclear behavior, an omission that, as I said, has important implications because this missing or omitted variable can lead to an overestimation of other causal variables, granting them too large an effect on the outcome, on the behavior that we, that we are studying, while rendering at least some of their effects spurious. So domestic models are filters through which security is defined. They explain why different actors within the same state vary in their approaches and, and preferences regarding nuclear policy, why nuclear policies within states may vary over time as a function of the relative power of particular domestic forces, why different states vary in their commitments to increase information, transparency, and compliance with the non-proliferation regime, why security dilemmas are more intractable in some cases than others, why some states ranked alliances higher than self-reliance. There's actually a very nice sentence in your book that says exactly, exactly that, that some states rank, obviously, alliances higher than self-reliance. Um, um, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, for instance, uh, but also vice versa. North Korea ranked self-reliance higher than alliances. Unless you understand what are the conditions that lead states to choose one or the other, uh, you're missing a um, large part of uh, the explanation. And finally, domestic models also explain why nuclear weapons programs surfaced where security <coughs> considerations hardly justify them. Uh, Libya is certainly one of those cases. And why such programs are obviated where one might have expected them. Again, Jordan, Turkey, Egypt, or others. So in sum, domestic models prevent the frequent overestimation of state security as a source of nuclear behavior and the underestimation of regime security as a crucial driver of denuclearization. And they also obviously provide a better foundation uh, for policy. So, um, Five? Okay. You're doing fine in terms of I'm doing fine. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm torn here between doing um, something about the future or... Um, okay, let me just say one other thing before I leave this topic quickly. So nuclear behavior, I said, provides um, a very easy arena to test a theory, to go back for a couple of minutes, uh, it, an easy arena to test a theory of high security. Uh, such as neorealism. But nuclear pre behavior provides an extremely difficult arena for testing theories of domestic political survival. Because political leaders cannot wield narrow considerations of individual, political party, or regime survival as the reason why they're pursuing this or that nuclear path. Even a dictator's acknowledgement that he needs nuclear weapons to sustain his own regime, although genuine, is imaginable, but guess what? Saddam actually did acknowledge in the um, Dilfer report um, that uh, it, it provided great help uh, for him uh, and his regime. So, um, but uh, those acknowledgments are in, uh, virtually unimaginable, and so are admissions by democratic leaders, let's say Japan circa early 1970s with Prime Minister Sato, admissions by democratic leaders that nuclear decisions in either direction uh, uh, may be driven by the need to fashion supportive coalitions favoring economic choices or to maximize electoral support from certain constituencies. 
uh, such reluctance to acknowledge those things, uh, to portray nuclear decisions in purely self-serving political terms, applies both to those favoring or renouncing nuclear weapons. Consider the difficulty in suggesting something like we should avoid nuclear weapons because they would undermine our corporation's ability to access world markets or our ability to attract foreign investment or our party's model of economic growth. But these things were very much in the minds of Prime Minister Sato, Park Chung-hee in South Korea, uh, Taiwanese leaders. I have a nugget of a story um, from Switzerland where I asked a group of um, officials why had Switzerland, Switzerland had a, um, considered at some point nuclear weapons and I said well what happened, why, uh, why did they, um, why did the program end and some people there said uh, well the bankers didn't like it. Um, so such calculations would be regarded with cynicism, <coughs> this regard for national security and would alienate even supporters of the favored <coughs> nuclear policy. So the political, what, what I'm trying to say here is that the political sensitivity of nuclear choices precludes candor to a greater extent than most other political issues. Thus, much of the public record on which I even build and even the private record often points to more legitimate considerations of relative power and state survival as underlying nuclear decisions. So what I'm trying to say, this is a hard arena to uncover, um, to uncover um, the kinds of arguments that I'm making, but precisely because decisions regarding nuclear weapons are least likely to validate the role of domestic politics, they provide a crucial and tough arena for investigating effects and even a partial substantiation uncovering an important role for domestic considerations in this and friendly terrain uh, from the point of view of the, uh, from a methodological point of view, where evidence is much harder to, to get, I think gains particular significance. Uh, in some of the literature and methodology, this is akin to a Sinatra inference. If the theory can make it here, it can make it anywhere. I'm not going that, uh, that far, uh, but let me, maybe say a word about um, the future of policy. What, what would be better to do? The, the, the future of policy? No, the f I have two, two things and I, know, I don't think I have time for both. Uh, what about the future? What does it say about the future or some policy implications of it? Yeah, Both. Okay, well, oh. okay, I'll, I'll, do I'll, do, I'll do fast. I'll do fast. Okay, I'll, I'll go fast. I think this audience is interested in both. Okay. But for those who have not heard the word theory used in these meetings very often, you'll be relieved to know there will not be a quiz after this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> there won't, but really I, want, I, 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 I wanted to provide a flavor of, of sometimes how removed, oh, how removed you know, this world is and what are the conventional wisdoms in other domains. That are, and I think in some ways the policy community is is more, um, more in tune with the role of domestic politics, but I also want to say that where I come out here uh, is not merely advocating, advocating just look at domestic politics, because domestic politics is another huge domain of inquiry. What I'm suggesting here is some kind of rule of thumb. You know, look at this sort of coalitional structure everywhere. It doesn't work everywhere in, to the same degree, but there is something about this uh, almost binary formation, and if you look at these different kinds, so it's a, it's, it's a good beginning, as good a beginning as sort of these vague considerations of relative power that don't tell you whether nuclear weapons will or will not enhance state security. So into the 21st century, so a theory, sorry, may well explain the past, but not be suitable to explain the future if the same scope conditions are not, no longer valid. Different mm -hmm. dynamics could be at work, triggering conditions under which internationalizing models perhaps may no longer provide sufficient conditions for continued denuclearization, let's say, in East Asia. But nonetheless, I think the framework proposed here provides a roadmap for considering the conditions <coughs> under which the expectations of this way of thinking might be corroborated or refuted. By the way, I did not go uh, into that aspect of neorealism, but neorealism in, uh, in many instances have been found to be um, uh, irrefutable. 
uh, to be almost tautological. Uh, we know that the state endured a particular security dilemma after they tested a nuclear weapon in October of uh, 2006 in the case of North Korea. We don't know in advance uh, any of these thresholds of relative power that lead a state to do this or that. So um, in this case, I, I, I hope I can show you that I actually lay out a framework where I said the theory may be correct in these in instances and incorrect in these others, but at least the expectations of this theory can be corroborated or refuted. And this in itself, I think, is a significant advantage uh, since uh, other frameworks uh, suffer from indeterminacy, tautology, and post hocism. We only know after it happened um, uh, why it happened. So in the spirit of providing hypotheses um, uh, of this nature that are cast in falsifiable terms, let me share with you this table that suggests four possible scenarios for the application of models of political survival to 21st century proliferation chains. Two of these scenarios are compatible with the premises of the framework uh, that I uh, provided here, and two other scenarios falsify those premises. So scenario one suggests a situation where leaders continue to steer internationalizing models in their respective countries and at the same time retain commitments to denuclearization. This is a joint ad outcome that would be compatible with uh, the, the framework's uh, expectations. And it's a scenario that matches the reality of most of East Asia into in the, at least at the early 21st century and in my view has a reasonable likelihood to persist provided most enabling central features remain in place including regional and global conditions, economic, political propitious for this model's survival. Uh, I know others of course are, uh, have other views about where East Asia may be going. I think scenario one is supported uh, among many other considerations by the presence of, for instance, 80, 80, no, 28,000 uh, Japanese companies employing over a million workers in China as of 2005, double the number of merely a decade ago, over one million Taiwanese entrepreneurs in the mainland. You know many of these figures, uh, and they, they are just um, um, instances of the nature, the evolving nature of East Asia uh, as a very interdependent region. Uh, former MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan, uh, official um, Kaneko Kumao, he drew attention to another prerequisite for the continuity of the post-war model of political survival. By the way, in Japan, this post-war model was um, incepted by Yoshida Shigeru, um, and uh, in some ways, in some fashion, this model uh, diffused through East Asia with different attributes, but very much shaped the trajectory for South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and, and many of the others, all the way to Singapore, and uh, finally China. Um, so um, Kaneko said, um, and I quote, uh, Japan maintains cooperative nuclear agreements with six countries, United States, Britain, France, Canada, Australia, and China. I personally negotiated most of this. If Japan misuse, misuses its civilian nuclear program for military purposes, a set of stringent sanctions will be imposed on it, including the immediate return of all important material uh, to the original exporting country. Should that ever happen, nuclear power plants in Japan would come to a grinding halt, crippling economic and industrial activities. It is simply unthinkable that the nation would be willing to make such a heavy sacrifice unless it was prepared to start a war. In this sense, the bilateral nuclear air energy agreements provided rather effective deterrent. Certain, okay. Uh, the, the, the fact that this is said today, uh, I think, is, 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 is powerful because Many of these considerations were crucial in the early 1970s when Japan was considering both signing and then ratifying uh, the NPT. One interesting uh, detail that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Japan, who is said to be driven by norms in its nuclear behavior, um, actually took seven years to ratify 
the MPT. It signed it in 1970, and it did not ratify it, ratify it until late 1976. Uh, the question is why this is, a, this is an inconvenient uh, argument for um, uh, approaches that think that Japan's behavior was driven purely by this anti-nuclear allergy, when indeed uh, Yoshida Shigeru's uh, doctrine was, was, was a crucial component of why Japan chose one way rather than the other, including uh, Kuneko's statement, uh, statement about the role of the um, nuclear energy industry and so on, uh, was so much more crucial back then than it is even today. Scenario three entails the continuity of internationalizing models accompanied by discontinuities in nuclear policies. So for instance, internationalizers may go nuclear, which would constitute an anomaly for the argument that I presented earlier. And this could happen. It may be perhaps less likely under the current circumstances of a strongly internationalizing East Asia, including China, uh, as the, locom the engine of the expanding global economy. But uh, should some leaders backtrack on internationalizing models in East Asia, the prospects of this uh, would be higher. Uh, for instance, a Chinese leadership that does not cope appropriately with domestic challenges of economic <coughs> transformation could be weakened or replaced by inward-looking opponents with attending regional consequences. Um, furthermore, internationalizing leaders everywhere are not immune to miscalculations in overplaying nationalist cards or falling victims to a concept called blowback or entrapment by inward-looking constituencies that are more favored to nuclearization. Um, one form of entrapment, I think, is, for instance, the 2005 Chinese legislation codifying a declaration of war against Taiwan if the latter declares independence, uh, which could be one, one unintended effect of, of, of this could be uh, such kind of miscalculation. In the Middle East, some suggested that Turkey, it's been written, could under some circumstance, circumstances reconsider its nuclear status. Uh, in the last two decades, Turkish leaders appear to have transcended the Middle East, uh, the classical Middle East model of inward looking. Um, an inward-looking path and have consolidated an internationalizing model that renounces nuclear weapons. If this choice was reversed while Turkey sustains an internationalizing model, the domestic survival argument would be refuted. However, if Turkey were to reverse, reverse its nuclear commitments in tandem with progressively more inward-looking domestic models, which we don't see today, uh, but may be exacerbated by e EU exclusion, then the argument uh, could lead in that direction. But um, scenario two now points to conditions where inward-looking models dominate, but nonetheless embrace denuclearization. So inward-looking models are in place, but they embrace denuclearization. The past record of nuclear aspirants shows that this joint occurrence has been rare, and this scenario certainly would constitute an anomaly or uh, um, a, a, it would not sustain the basic argument uh, I uh, discussed here, and could be illustrated, for instance, by situations where inward-looking regimes, either in North Korea or the Middle East, implement durable, transparent, mutually and unconditionally verifiable agreements renouncing nuclear capabilities without at the same time shifting to uh, an internationalizing model of political survival. Um, if changes, as in the case of Libya, take place in tandem with this shift, uh, then I think that the argument uh, uh, would be sustained. Um, scenario four very briefly suggests resilient inward-looking leaders resistant to internationalization, which is a defining characteristic of much of the Middle East, but not all, uh, accompanied by intermittent efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. This scenario, of course, is compatible with the basic framework uh, I proposed here, 
and its permanence does not bode well for the denuclearizing shifts in that part of the world. Did you just flip two and four in this discussion there? I mean, you said two. I, I, I may your, have. Your two box was I may have. Was, so was, the scenario of sustained inward, yeah. inward looking and nuclearization, mm -hmm. um, reasonably kind of right. likely. Yeah. Um, She's right. <laughs> right. Right. You think it's right? <laughs> Uh, and the scenario of... But you call that scenario four, I think. The reason I'm, like sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. The okay. not very likely scenario is a scenario where inward-looking uh, coalitions engage in denuclearization without at the same time... So this is not Libya. Right? Yeah. Libya does both at the same time. Uh, it's a case where you don't change the overall, uh, you know, uh, model of political survival, you know, export-led, driven, integration into the global economy, but you change your nuclear policy. That's very clear. No, that's yeah, clear. yeah, sorry about that. Um, maybe, yeah. Maybe wrap up in five minutes so we can have some time for Perfect. questions. Perfect, sure, yeah. sure. So, very briefly, issues regarding policy then. First of all, there's a problem of the issue of causal versus manipulative variable, manipulable variables. Even a proper identification of what really drives denuclearization or nuclearization does not mean that we can easily translate uh, the causal process into manipulable uh, policies. It's not always so easy to do that. So, but understanding the main drivers goes a long way in improving policy. Second, second po general point I want to make, I have some more um, um, detailed points in the last chapter of the book. But the second general point is that external policies, including national and international policies, that uh, international policies from national and international economic <coughs> institutions, purposefully but also unintendedly influence the domestic interplay of forces and those effects have to be understood in their devil details. At the same time, it is important to understand that the domestic game is not always reducible to international manipulation. There are limits imposed by our ability to foresee and control all intended and unintended consequences so that powerful internal dynamics do not always render themselves to external intervention. And the third thing I'd like to point out is that policies must be suitable to different institutional environments within which models operate. Clearly, Iran is not North Korea, even though both are authoritarian forms. Uh, different institutional contexts may require different mixes of aid, trade, benefits, investments, debt relief, food, and selective removal from export control uh, lists. So I want to leave you with the sense that domestic models provide a different foundation for the design of positive and negative inducements than those conceiving of states as unified actors. Positive inducements should aim at strengthening domestic advocates of models pivoted on economic growth and integration in the global economy, while also curbing domestic <coughs> demand for nuclear weapons. Policies should reward natural constituencies of internationalizing models as indirectly and multilaterally as possible. The stronger these constituencies become, the less willing they will be to bear the economic, social, and political consequences of nuclear programs and the external instability that they often induce. And we see this in many of the countries um, at work. Negative inducements, um, very briefly, I have a discussion of uh, what potential positive inducements, but negative inducements uh, should be directed at domestic actors with stakes in nuclear industrial complexes and ancillary political economic structures that thrive under protection and state control. Of course, the Boniads in Iran, uh, fiefdoms of uh, the Pasdaran um, are cases in point, although Apparently, it's the case also that Pazdaran itself is divided on some of these issues. But the idea, of, the idea is to strip autarkic or inward-looking um, constituencies of the means to concentrate a power. When you introduce markets, openness, transparency, foreign investment, conditionality, structural adjustment, export-led industrialization, it harms states and private invest, uh, institutions and monopolistic enterprises that thrive under closure. 
Uh, there is, of course, the issue of timetables that Rob and others uh, have addressed uh, very directly. You know, how effective might these things be in the short term? In 1994 and 5, I published a couple of articles um, uh, trying to put some of these ideas to work. At the time, again, the academic discussion did not seem ripe to depart from neorealist thinking and uh, continued to treat uh, the nuclear proliferator state as this monolithic entity, but I think in the aftermath of Iraq, Libya, and North Korea, we've become, we've granted more consideration to positive and negative inducements that are sensitive to the domestic distributional effects of those policies. Because even, even today, and I'll, I'll end with that, even today when we discuss positive and neg negative inducements, I read some of it, we tend to have, we tend not to include as part of the analysis uh, a, de a um, systematic analysis of the domestic uh, distributional consequences of those po those policies. So, if we throw WTO uh, at Iran, who benefits and who loses? These are sort of the kinds of crucial questions that I think have to be asked. Thank you very much. That's very kind of uh, wide-ranging, <coughs> rich presentation. Let's open it up now. Comments and questions. If speakers could just uh, identify themselves, we'll begin with the woman here, and then we'll move back to the gentleman. Yeah. Uh, Bernadette Kilroy from the State Department. Uh, the um, coalitional type, uh, internationalizing versus inward-looking. Can you give us more definition as to? what qualifies a case to fall into one versus the other. And I, you know, looking at slide, um, the slide with finding number four, you listed a couple of cases, I think North Korea and Iran, and um, I forget which, which, what the others were, but those are very different types of regimes with very different types of coalitions. So I'd just like to get more definition of, of, of that, I guess, variable. Thank you. Do you want me to collect some questions or? Sure. Why don't we take these three and then and then we'll do a merged questions. Go ahead. Uh, Hugh Gustafson from George Mason University. For number four, I'd like to suggest uh, Kazakhstan. Um, but I have, my main question is about the case of India, which I noticed you didn't talk about very much. And India in the late 1990s uh, does five nuclear tests, but it does it uh, as it's in the process of joining the global economy. It's negotiating to become part of the WTO. It's uh, re-engineering its intellectual property mm -hmm. laws. It's letting Monsanto and other companies into its agricultural system. So it's completely opening itself up to outsourcing into the global economy, and it's intensifying its nuclearization in violation of global norms. So how do you explain that? Okay. Um, Howard Moreland. It, it seems to me that uh, you haven't mentioned that nuclear weapons are, in fact, instruments of military force, and their only purpose really is blowing up cities. We, after 50 years of experimenting with this, that, and the other, we always come back to blowing up cities is the only reason you really need nuclear weapons, and a lot of nations have just decided they don't have a need to be able to blow up cities. Okay. Okay, Shai. Sure. Take those. Actually, um, let's see if I can... something that will make normal progression. You can see I have a menu there. Um, there's a way I can answer Bernadette's question very quickly if I no. Okay. I have a, a, a list of um, usual suspects in, in each coalition. Right, constituencies that tend to be associated uh, with inward-looking coalitions. So it includes largely uh, economies or political economies that are dominated by state state enterprises uh, of the kind that even um, countries in South America had. Argentina and Brazil are, are instances. Um, um, uncompetitive sectors of the economy are usual sus suspects in that coalition. The military is an interesting, um, interesting actor. It tends to be part of 
anti-internationalizing coalitions or inward-looking coalitions because internationalization entails rationalization of the economy and um, funds for military industrial complexes tend not to be abundant when you're un un under IMF or other kind of conditionality arrangements, so the military never likes them. However, however, there have been instances such as Park Chung-hee in South Korea uh, and others, um, Chile is another instance, where, uh, uh, for instance, Park Chung-hee marshaled, first of all, created enough cleavages in the, within the military that he could marshal part of the military to endorse his export-led industrialization. Over time, 10 years into the economic miracle, the military loves it. Uh, there are more resources now for the military and so on. So it's, 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 it's hard to generalize the military. In Iran, there are many more people here knowledgeable, uh, far more knowledgeable uh, about Iran than I am, but I'm told that elements of the conventional military <coughs> in Iran are not very thrilled at segments of the past Iran going on their own, creating you know, an alternative military structure and so on and so forth. So th th those things vary. But you can tell uncompetitive industries that enjoy state protection, of course, are bound to be part of those coalitions. So I have an array of actors in, on this side of the equation and on this side of the equation who would be interested. That, that, and those, uh, all of those are deductions or inferences from theories of international political economy, really, that actually, Bernadette, you know a lot about that. <laughs> so now, um, the question on India never fails uh, to appear. Uh, the, book, the book is entitled Contrasting Paths in East Asia and the Middle East. There are at least nine reasons why this is a very tractable comparison. I didn't have time, obviously, to, to go over what the nine reasons are. But in a nutshell, there, is, there are many factors that can be controlled when you compare uh, these two regions, but not others, including, including uh, controlling for um, the nature of relative power, of polarity. So you want to compare apples with apples. So for instance, some of these neorealist theories contend that multipolar systems are more bound to produce nuclearized regions. But when we go out there in the world and we observe East Asia and the Middle East, they look very different. So two multipolar systems show not just defeat the idea that they, they're bound to be nuclearized, but also you see a difference between the two regions uh, which questions whether polarity has an enormous amount to do with whether the region goes uh, in a denuclearizing uh, path or, 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 or not. That's number one. South Asia would have pol polluted, so to speak, the, the, the sample because it's, an, it, it's a slightly different, mostly bipolar situation. In addition, I said I'm looking at the post-1968 period which is a period uh, where uh, the uh, NPT has already been signed and India and Pakistan remain outside of the NPT. Most of the, so I had to control to see the effect, if there was any, and I claim there was some uh, of the NPT on the behavior of these countries. Again, um, India and Pakistan would uh, not fit that. In addition to that, um, uh, I said at the outset that this, the this analysis or this theory, this approach is falsifiable, right? So if it was indeed the case that India does not fit the argument, it would be a very good attribute to have a theory that is falsifiable, unlike other theories uh, that seem to not to be. So if it were the case that it, 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 it wouldn't fit the argument, it would be. But I learned from um, colleagues and experts on India that actually, including you know, people who have published very important books in this area, that actually it does fit. Uh, the the um, kind of superficial analysis of what happened in 1998 doesn't get you all the way back to the 1970, 1974, which is when India really explodes its first nuclear device. And at this time, India is the quintessential inward-looking uh, um, coalition. Uh, and the party that takes over in the late 1990s, yes, proclaims a lot of uh, Interna internationalization, but as I learned also from economists uh, 
friends and colleagues um, uh, knowledgeable of India, it really doesn't start uh, until much after because the uh, BJP has this policy of Swadeshi. Swadeshi is a term coined by the BJP uh, to portray some form of what North Korea calls chuche, mm -hmm. inward looking, inward looking uh, economic sectors and so on. So there may be something there, but I think at this point, India is an inconclusive, um, inconclusive uh, case, whether or not it fits. And again, you know, either way, either way would be, um, would be fine. Uh, Howard Mullins, um, statement I, I gather is that one that says, well, people understand now that there's no need to blow cities, and that accounts for, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand whether, that was a, a, a yeah, some people understand that, but when, back to the example of <coughs> India, you know, the nuclear tests in India and Pakistan <coughs> had enormous approval by the public, so one wonders if everybody understands uh, what you understand about nuclear weapons. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, yeah. Carrie Anderson with Oxford Analytica. You mentioned, <coughs> you mentioned Egypt as a country that has given up uh, its pursuit of nuclear weapons. But in the last couple of years, it's announced that it's interested in pursuing a nuclear energy program. It's refuse to sign the additional protocol, none of which means, of course, it's necessarily going to develop nuclear weapons. But I was wondering if you consider this a proliferation concern, and if so, how that might affect your analysis. Let's take this question here, and then uh, I've got one, and then we'll wrap, it, wrap up the questions, give you a final chance to respond. Etel, go ahead. Would you uh, subscribe to the theory that um, Morris Klein Morris retired Klein. Los Alamos? Uh, would you s subscribe to the theory that when a state that's inward looking decides to look out, be part of the industrial community, it has to somehow prove itself that it's equal to, they're not just this uh, poor uh, neighbor, they want to uh, get out into the open, into the industrialized world, they want to do it with a bang. So, your Brazil, Argentina, Iran, North Korea. To make that transition, they need um, to prove themselves to their internal, that a change is about to occur, and they are equal to all the others around them. Uh, I just wanted to ask you to <coughs> further develop, I guess it's, it's uh, building on the question from, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, the woman from Oxford Analytica. Uh, Carrie Anderson. Uh, Carrie Anderson's question about this, this issue of nuclear hedging and sort of cultivating ambiguity and, and you know, we're expecting the other shoe to drop that Mr. Al-Barada, Dr. Al-Barada is going to say that the Iranian program has cleared up all these questions and now it's, it's an okay <laughs> civilian nuclear energy program and, and uh, uh, et cetera. And then you've got countries that say, like Egypt, hey, we were interested in nuclear power and everyone just hears nuclear weapons or, you know, Saudi Arabia or, or Abu Dhabi, whichever one's that there. William brought out an article in the uh, New York Times about 20 countries that are looking yeah. at it. So how does, how do you, how does that, that aspect, uh, the hedging piece, fit into your nuclear logics argument? So these are all very good questions. Let's see if I can, how, how, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, care, okay, so let me take uh, Paris and yours um, together. Or maybe, maybe Maurice, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question, but you're saying that sometimes inward-looking countries <coughs> want to show they belong out there into... They want to break out. They want the to break out. They're in transition. That's the danger. They're in transition. But, but, but you mentioned Argentina. What confused me is that you mentioned Argentina and Brazil. Argentina and Brazil acted according sort of to the expectations that when you go, when you want to go out there, get foreign investment, for real, change your economy, really transform your economic foundation. Argentina and Brazil were countries that I know well, um, uh, very inward looking, statist par excellence uh, to some extent um, to this day, but they've, they've gone, um, in the 1990s they've, they've made major strides in undoing that, um, that edifice of uh, inward looking economies. When they did that, it was 
very clear cut. It was a no-brainer that that was the time when they had to join the MPT, sign and ratify the Tlatelolco Treaty, uh, and do all the um, um, motions that are required to become a respected member of the international community, a stable member of the inter foreign investments, access to markets and resources. So that's sort of the way the way I envisage that passage into an internationalizing um, mode. Um, I think I think I may uh, I think I understand what you're saying when you when you're talking about Iran, right? That that passage for Iran would entail some card that shows yeah, they're that playing the card. They want to be yeah. a regional player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they no, a regional player. Yeah, they want recognition by the uh, world, and they show it by going nuclear or threatening to go. I, I I don't I, I don't dispute that that may be the path. I'm just saying usually what I've observed looking at actually 14 cases. I only spoke about the nine in East Asia and the Middle East. Is that in tandem with it? And Libya is a, another good example. In tandem with that transition, you usually uh, somebody wrote about Libya. Actually, you, uh, I think it was Bill Keller in the New York Times. Uh, you hang your nooks at the door and move on to another strategy of political survival, export-led, you know, economic growth through integration in the global economy. You don't need nukes to do that. They're not valuable sources to do I that. Agree. Yeah, they're not. It works for Libya, but if all you've got is kimchi in North Korea, you don't, <laughs> you don't really have that option. So, uh, uh, maybe, but yeah. there, may, maybe, you're, maybe you're right, except I even there, and it's very yeah. hard to get information on there, but even there, uh, um, there, there is, I don't want to say a tug of war, but there are some different views and different interests. You know, the managers of export processing zones yeah. in North Korea don't see the world the same as some of these True. hard, yeah. I mean, you read Nodong Sigmund, which mm -hmm. <laughs> I become, um, um, you know, conditioned to look at how they coin these things. Actually, they have a very interesting way of linking these two domains, saying, mm -hmm. you know, forget economic reform and pursue nuclear weapons. I mean, they're just so clear there. Mm -hmm. But now to the question of Egypt. Um, I think Egypt is indeed an interesting case. The first casualty of understanding Egypt, forgive me, but I go back to neorealism, is neorealism. Because for Egypt, an adjacent country, not a country in the region, but its adjacent neighbor, is said, was said at the time, even in the 1960s, to have gone uh, nuclear, to have acquired nuclear capabilities. It's a huge anomaly for neorealism uh, that it doesn't go nuclear unless, unless, it's not, un unless Israel wasn't perceived as a threat. And there are indications that many people thought, yes, it wasn't a threat. Israel wasn't necessarily going to use um, those weapons to threaten Egypt. But whatever the case, neorealism is a casualty because it didn't, it didn't operate the way it, it, it should have. Now, uh, the... Would that change for Egypt if, if Israel went overt from, you know, the ambiguity? Would they feel compelled then? Uh, actually, domestic pressure or something, do something? Or, uh, I, was going, I was going to actually address it by saying that it's interesting that after 40 years of an adjacent, pr presumed, imputed, adjacent, nuclearized neighbor, Egypt did not steer from its denuclearized path, but once Iran uh, becomes a factor in the Middle East, then you see much more conversations about this issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, how a, that works is not- There's a debate in Israel if they should go overt to deter Iran, but that could have a knock-on effect with Egypt, uh -huh. sort of stimulating that, so it's very interesting. Interesting, know. but yeah. the way it works with Iran, again, I wanna, I wanna keep, Keep the argument straight. It's not about Iran as a strategic actor uh, endangering Egypt. Iran is not a, a strategic danger to Egypt immediately. They're far removed and so on and so forth. The danger here is, is again, the way in which Iran's program is spinned domestically in Egypt, enhancing the forces of that say, hey, look, you know, Ahmadinejad is doing this and that. We should be doing so again, the filter of domestic politics is inevitable. It's a sine qua non. It cannot be, you know, none of this can be understood without, um, and I do go at some length on the case of Egypt in, 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 in this domain, um, 
on, on this issue. Now, um, the hedging one. Yeah, okay. but by the way, just one last point sure. maybe about Egypt that the uh, overlap of uh, Sadat's transition from a, n from a n nuclear program that was in existence p perhaps under, um, was in existence under Nasser, but it's unclear until when, right? The transition between 1973-74 into a denuclearized uh, strategy on the part of uh, Saddam and his transition to infita, you know, economic reform in the Middle East is just amazing. And there's a lot of material that really links these two moves. Why are they so logically connected? You know, the um, civilian nuclear program in Egypt. So it, it, it's, re it's really amazing. Uh, same in Libya. Hedging. Um, we'll conclude with that. Okay. We'll conclude with that. Okay. Uh, hedging is is an interesting concept, and uh, and, and and who can who can deny that uh, some of that may be going. Actually, the hedging the hedging factor I think was revived in the context of Japan. You know, that Japan has its cake and can eat it too, and so on. I'm a little I'm I, without. First of all, uh, it is said that you know three months or. Three months is the time when you can actually convert, you know, this and that. I never, I'm not very persuaded by that. Um, um, I think if Japan needed to, there, there may be people that think it's helpful, no question about it, but if Japan needed to make a statement about its nuclearization, there have been so many instances when Japan could have done that. Japan is one case that has observed the nuclearization of its Three, not one, not two, three regional powers, China, the, the Soviet Union, and North Korea more recently. All the, uh, all the predicted nuclearizations of Japan uh, by you know, several scholars have never materialized. Uh, so how, you know, the threshold keeps changing. What has to happen? What, what has to happen? So the, you know, uh, that doesn't necessarily deny that hedging might be useful, but if Japan wanted to make a declaration, it could. And, and um, well, I guess I'd leave it at that. That's terrific. Well, okay. I, 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 this is a marvelous book, and, and uh, my, I, I'm not based at a university. I don't know how, how academics sort of judge it, but in my, my view, nothing is, is more difficult in that analysis than really uh, just superb comparative work and the, the, the amount of work for those who've done studies I mean the amount of work that has to go into look at nine 13 cases it's really uh, uh, an, an enormous accomplishment and then to put it all together uh, drawing across sort of you know com in a comparative framework um, it's very useful I mean a lot to debate but extremely extremely useful uh, analytical work uh, thank you for giving us an overview of it today please join me in thanking